If you're just joining, you are at the webinar, We Can See Patient Lessons Learned from Radical Perspectives. And we're giving some folks some time to sign in for a bit. Um, and then our host will kick things off and do all the introductions, but you're in the right place. So thank you for being here. For those of you joining us who have colleagues or friends who are planning to watch through the Facebook live stream, we are experiencing some technical difficulties, but the um, webinar will be available online on our website at unitedsurvivors.com. My name is Rosie Bowder. For those of you that I have um, yet to meet, welcome. I am serving on the board of directors with United Suicide Survivors International, or United Survivors for short, and I am particularly excited about today's uh, webinar with Kalechi Ubuzo, um, as I saw her in featured in the S Word documentary last year and said, wow, what an incredible woman. I want to hear more from her. And today I have the wonderful opportunity, as, as do all of you attending, to hear more from her. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this webinar will be recorded. It will be available on our website, Unite Survivors. There will be some times throughout the uh, Kalechi's presentation where we'll be able to ask any questions or if you have any comments, feel free to include them in the chat function on the bottom right hand corner. If you're wondering, oh, why can't I hear myself? Um, so we have uh, the ability to use the chat. Um, we're gonna use that instead of asking questions through the audio, just to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to um, have their question recorded and written down. And then um, we'll also be, I'll be, positing some questions to you all to reflect on as we go through. All right, well, that being said, I wanna read a little bit more about Kalechi and um, give, her, give her a proper introduction. So as I mentioned, Kalechi Ubuzo is a nationally recognized Nigerian American writer and mental health advocate. Her story of recovery was featured in O, the Oprah Magazine, on CBS This Morning with Gail King and Good Morning America. Kalechi was also featured in the SAMHSA Voice award-winning documentary, The S Word, which follows the lives of suicide attempt survivors to end the stigma and silence around suicide. Previously, Kalechi supervised mental health programs and research at PEERS, a mental health nonprofit organization. She also worked on a statewide project with Mental Health Association of San Francisco, where she applied evidence-based research from Dr. Patrick Corrigan to train Speakers Bureau on how to share targeted mental health recovery messages. Her very first book, which is out now, you can order it online, with co-editor L.D. Green, is titled We've Been Too Patient, Voices from Radical Mental Health, and it was released this summer from North Atlantic Books and Penguin Random House. We've Been Too Patient is a collection of diverse stories of radical healing and consider it the recent movement towards reform in the mental health field, including the consumer movement, peer support, and trauma-informed care. She currently works at Cal MHSA as the Peer and Community Engagement Manager, and I am so excited to turn it over to Kalechi. Take it away. Oh, well, thank you so much, Rose. I appreciate it, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, again, I'm Kalechi Bozo, and I'm excited to share my story with you, talk about perspectives from uh, the field, and really kick things off. Um, so I just want to first say thank you to United Survivors and Sally Spencer Thomas for creating space for suicide attempt survivors to have these conversations. Um, and yeah, and thank you for talking about the book. We've been too patient and I'm gonna be sharing some lessons learned from radical perspectives. Um, and I will just have to say my co-editor, LD Green, we, we, would not have, we would not be here without, that, without her on that project. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I wanna tell you a little bit about our learning objectives today. I wanna to make sure I cover all three and give us time. I'm gonna pause after each uh, of the learning objectives um, to make sure that I have time for your questions because I am not a multitasker. So um, better to know your strengths and just pause. Um, but our learning objectives today are to understand several myths and stereotypes about the experience of suicide attempt survivors, um, hear perspectives from contributors about issues with the biomedical model um, and what that definition is and what all that means. And then also to recognize the terminology of radical mental health. And I will say that for some of you, 
um, the perspective of radical mental health when we talk about what the definition is will not feel radical at all. It will seem like basic human rights that should be met. Um, but for other folks, it is radical. So I do want to call that out. There is definitely a continuum of radical and you all are welcome to your perspectives um, about that. And I would love to hear more about that. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my story. Um, and I want to you know, Rosie did a great job introducing me, but I am, like I said, uh, like she said, I am a Nigerian American. I'm a suicide attempt survivor. Um, I'm also a published writer, a daughter, a karaoke singer, and um, a recovering Game of Thrones fan. So if you are someone who would like to have a whole nother webinar about that, uh, feel free to reach out um, or possibly a support group because I might need one. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and start telling you more about how I grew up and a little bit more about my life. So I will say that 10 years ago, um, I attempted a suicide. So this is my 10 year um, anniversary of that event. I was 24, I was living in New York. I was having a really tough time um, and a lot of really challenging experiences and hearing some really tough messages. Um, and the work still continues and we can talk about survivor stories and what that means and what a good survivor story is and what there's judgment about a bad survivor story um, from some of my colleagues in suicidology who have some perspectives about that but really I want to say that this is my 10 year anniversary and I you know I grew up in New York my mom is uh, from Brooklyn my dad is from Nigeria um, and you know, really early on, um, they divorced and she moved us down south. Um, I have this quote up here that is uh, in this picture. And so that's me when I'm little and my mother. Um, and I have the quote there um, that says, I was told I was broken and that I would never get better. I was also told my experience wasn't real. And I share that with you right next to this like very sweet picture of me and my mother to say that like no one should have ever heard that message that was destructive and horrible um no human no small child no person no older adult should hear that they're broken and that there's no hope for them and that was my introduction into um the mental health system essentially so backing up a little bit um born in brooklyn moved down to Stone Mountain, Georgia with my mother um, who worked in primary care and opening a business. And, you know, Georgia was a very different experience for me. I was very, I always felt different. Um, it also helped that I was a black goth girl. So imagine that in a, a very conservative area <laughs> and just really sticking out and not really fitting in anywhere. Um, and then also being faced with a lot of racism, other isms, just just kind of confused about my place in the world. So my mother has my grandmother come down to really help when I'm a teenager because it's a lot to run your own business and be a single, uh, single parent. So I just have to say my grandmother was the most amazing human that ever lived, at least in my experience. She she thought every meal should have dessert involved. Um, she thought I could do no wrong. I mean, really unconditional love, like I've never experienced. Um, and, you know, she would watch my Tamagotchi when I was at school, um, cause we weren't allowed to bring it there. And she, you know, we'd really hang out and I'd watch episodes of Matlock with her. And it was just, our existence was, was like simple, but just very loved and cared for. And, you know, she kind of marveled at my choice of combat boots with fishnets, but there was really no judgment, um, just lots of kisses. Um, and when my grandmother started becoming ill and then was later diagnosed with lung cancer and slowly deteriorated, my mental health deteriorated as well. Um, I want to be careful not to say that this is the only thing that was going on at the time. I think sometimes we want to say that was the reason. That's what happened. It, it was very complex. There was racism. There was not fitting in in the African-American community or in the dominant culture, the white community in my area, just feeling like just othered. Um, and then losing this person um, felt really, really hard. So when my grandmother eventually passed away, I didn't want to live anymore. Um, I 
I thought that it was very bizarre that I was alive and she wasn't. And it just felt like my world ended and I was still alive and that didn't make sense. And I just didn't, I didn't want to be around anymore. Um, and I didn't think there was anything crazy about that. Um, it made perfect sense to me. So I ended up telling a friend who ended up telling a teacher um, and the teacher told my mom and my mom did what most parents would do in that situation with limited resources and not, you know, a lot of options really. Um, she took me to a hospital and ha had me um, taken into like a hospital for, for, young, for young adults. And the hospital situation, what happened to me in the hospital was so difficult and so traumatic and so not useful. Um, that I really learned two things. Um, one, how to never go to a hospital again. And the second thing that I learned was um, that if I tell people what I really feel, it makes them really uncomfortable. So I better not tell people this. I should pretend to be um, sane or make people feel comfortable and just not talk about suicide. Um, it didn't also erase any of the thoughts that I had. It just made me think of them differently. Um, a large another large thing was you know when you're when you're young and you're in a psych ward i mean it's scary um you know they put you on suicide watch you're on an uncomfortable cot you're kind of there's like really big lights on they take away your shoelaces and that's when i also heard i was broken that i would never get better and i would always be reliant on medication for the rest of my life and these were these messages that just were really problematic and um troubling but i internalized them i didn't you know i thought oh these are professionals they know and i also don't want to come back here so what ended up happening and it's some for for some people it was clear i still wasn't okay for others it might not be so clear but i took all of the feelings that i had and i stuffed them deep down inside of myself and then i just pretended to be happy um and i wouldn't say that that worked so well um but I did end up going to, you know, fast forward a little bit and, you know, the thoughts aren't going away. Um, I do try to get some help. It's not really helpful because I'm not fully um, honest in um, my therapy sessions because I'm so afraid of being hospitalized again. Um, so I'm not really like always disclosing things because I want to do disclose enough to get some help, but not too much to be in a situation that will feel unsafe and bad. So I ended up going to college. Um, in New York at SUNY Purchase, and that really was a very positive experience for me. I got to be a journalist, which was really exciting. I got to write stories. I got to be connected with other people. Um, the shadow side of that was that I got to connect with other people, but they didn't really know me. And, um, and as any journal journalist or someone who is maybe a therapist or does work where you're talking to people about themselves, sometimes they're not always aware that... Um, that you have experiences too, because they feel connected because you're talking to them. So they're not always saying, oh, how are you doing, Kalechi? And it was a way for me to connect with people and also hide, because I really cared and deeply connected with folks and all of those feelings about them was true. But what I didn't, what I wasn't honest with was like how I felt, where I was and the things that I was going through. So um, I, end up graduating from college. I have these really amazing opportunities. I get published in the New York Times. I'm kind of at this all time high and it's in 2007. And then the next year is 2008. Um, everything kind of falls apart. Um, lots of people move back home to go back home with their parents. Uh, the economy is just uh, disastrous. I'm working four or five jobs. Well, really I'm working three, three jobs and then two side hustles to kind of stay in New York and still write. Um, and I'm really struggling with thoughts. I'm, I'm having some challenges again. All of the, you know, what my future is gonna look like has totally shifted and I'm, things are not going well at all. So I decide for the first time in a long time that maybe I should just get some help. So I, I go and I reach out to some therapists and what I heard was, well, you're too, you're too sick. Um, you're suicidal. We don't see people. Um, you might be uh, a liability for us. Um, and so I tried to get help there. And I actually uh, went, and you know, I felt about hospitals, but I decided, I was like, you know what? Things are really bad. I'm really scared. I'm going to hurt myself. Let me go check myself in. So when I tried to check myself into a hospital, um, 
they, I am able to clearly articulate, like I'm having thoughts, I'm having ideations, I'm thinking about self-harm. Um, I need some support. Um, can you help me? And because I was able to articulate that I needed help, uh, the staff were like, you don't need help. You're totally fine. You're able to say that you need help. And so they wouldn't realize my experience. I also think it was because I was a black woman um, and there's a way of presenting even when things are falling apart. Um, I was raised by, I was raised by a New York black woman who was just, you know, saying that we represent our families and we have to be very careful. Um, I don't know if it's culture. I don't know if it's a woman thing. I don't know what it is, but however I presented um, made people not believe me. And I don't think that was me. I think that was on them. There was some racism. There was some bias. There was some disbelief that I could be in pain because I could articulate my pain. So I end up getting, um, I end up getting into treatment at the um, center. And for anyone who's watched the S word film, this is the, um, the, the infamous, uh, infamous psych ward. I, I'm there and there's only two options for health. There's art and then there's movie time. And movie time was watching Silence of the Lambs. Um, Silence of the Lambs was the movie choice. And I was shocked. I was like, is this a joke? Are you serious? You're wa you were watching Silence of the Lambs in a psych ward. You can't make this up. Um, and I, when I went to ask the nurse if this was an appropriate movie choice, she, she said, wow, you're really high functioning. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's a total jab that's saying, oh, wow, you, you, you are, you know, you're a high functioning person with mental health issues. It's, it's not a compliment. It's more of like not reflecting that they're doing something wrong, but putting it back on me, like calling them out. Um, so these were the interactions and needless to say, I didn't get support in that scenario. And I was pretty much released uh, quickly afterwards after a lot of um, interesting over medication um, and being very much drugged. I mean, it really was, I was kind of in this uh, fog or haze um, and then they released me. So that didn't help. And I was kind of at a loss because I was struggling. I didn't understand my future. I just couldn't figure it out. I had tried to get help. And what ended up happening next was that I was raped by someone who I thought was my friend. Um, and when that happened, I just didn't want to be here anymore. Like all of the things that I stuck down came all the way up. It was like, it was like, you can't pretend you can't put on this mask. Um, you have to do something different. Um, and to me, that was taking, taking me out of the equation. So I attempted, um, we don't talk about methods because, um, that's not helpful for anyone or healthy. Um, but I will say that I tried to kill myself and I survived. And the next day I did not feel like, you know, I didn't feel like, oh my goodness, I'm so grateful to be alive. But I did say, well, that didn't work. What else can I do if I'm gonna be, if I'm gonna stay here? So it's not the shiny recovery story of I'm so grateful. It was more of like, well, I need to maybe do something different. Um, so my mom, and she's an amazing woman, she came up um, from Georgia and she said, all right, let's figure this out. We created a crisis plan together. We figured out what would be useful. Um, and I got trauma-informed care, which means that I got care that I got to decide. I got to weigh in on what would work and what didn't work. I got to understand what was going on with me. And it wasn't about an illness or, or symptoms. It was more about this is how you're operating in the world. This is what your trauma looks like. This is what healing will look like for you. That was a lot of getting boundaries. Um, that was a lot of uh, removing toxic people from my life um, and looking at the stuff that I was involved in because I was involved in um, a lot of things that weren't helpful for me either um, and having to take accountability, which wasn't comfortable or fun. Like people say, do your work. I'm like, it's not, I mean, it's great, but it's not fun. Um, like it's not, it's not always a feel good time, but it was really worthwhile. So Moving away from that, I'm in Georgia, I'm healing, I'm working on myself, and I decide, you know, you know, after doing some work with myself and my mother, of like learning what do things look like when things break down, what will happen um, if this happens again, what should I do, um, having really honest conversations and not pretending, um, finding a good therapist who listened, um, and for me, it wasn't medication, that wasn't what was helpful for me, um, it was 
a lot of a lot of work around my childhood and trying to understand where I belonged and that I was worth I was worth something. Um, it was a lot of self worth for me. So I'm in Georgia. A lot of other things happen in Georgia, but we don't have time to get into all of that. What I will say is that I did hear about um, the California advocacy and things that were going on about people who are called mental health consumers or peers. So people who have lived experience with mental health issues, but they receive training in their recovery and they help other people. And I was like, wow, California is doing some amazing things. I would like to go out there and work and be part of that movement to change the system because the system was the thing that was broken, not me. Um, and people kept telling me that I was broken over and over again. Um, I might have a lot of issues or big emotion, but nothing was compared to the trauma that I faced in the system. Um, for example, when I did end up uh, going to, you know, attempting and end up being in a psych ward again, um, the first thing a nurse said was, why, why did you, why did you let yourself get raped? Um, I, I say that not to say, here are my wounds, look at them, but to say this is someone in charge of treatment and care and blaming a victim, blaming a survivor, if you don't like the word, the word victim, about being attacked. Um, and this is someone who, who might've been working there too long, um, saw no, no problem with that, said, you should, you should learn some self-defense. Uh, you should take care of yourself better. Um, horrible. That's not what you say to people. So again, when we think about sending our loved ones away, that's what away looks like. That's what I received. Away was not good. Um, and just something to be mindful of. So I sent myself away. And my version of that was moving to California, working in mental health advocacy um, at a consumer-run organization with people with lived experience like me. It was really powerful and life-affirming and amazing. And I still struggle. Like, it did not, you know, uh, it, it's still a process. But now I have a safety net and um, I have people who are there to support me and I know what I need and I know what I ask for. I'm gonna go into one more slide and then I'm gonna pause for any questions that have come up. So a lot of times people say like, well, how do you show up for someone who is having a mental health crisis um, or is feeling suicidal? And I'll have some other examples from other folks, but I wanna just share from the book how my friends showed up. So when I was really depressed and I couldn't leave my house, um, following um, a, you know, a, a big breakup um, and then also the person who attacked me reached out. There's a lot of like ch big triggers that happened um, and that do continue to happen in life. But um, just feeling like I couldn't leave my house, my friends would buy groceries or take me shopping for basic needs. Um, I had other friends take me to art exhibits and museums and you know I love karaoke so karaoke was really important. Singing, singing angsty goth songs really made me feel better. Um, I had friends send me funny text messages or just check in daily at other friends who, who, you know, like not everyone is great at talking. So we went on walks or um, would go into the redwoods. The redwoods for me is really healing. Those just old trees feel like they have a lot of wise wisdom and I feel safe there. Um, I had another friend send coloring books or letters with well wishes. Um, folks would sit with me who are more comfortable talking and just sit with me while I just cried and fell apart and wanted to talk, and others would just kind of watch Netflix with me when I didn't want to talk. Um, and I think there's kind of, at any point I might need all of these things, or I might just need one of these things, but for me, that's how my friends showed up. And I showed up for being accountable, accountable and asking for them to be there for me, because sometimes asking for what you need is really difficult. Um, I have at the bottom, uh, beware of the good survivor story versus the bad survivor story um, and some unintended consequences. So um, Jess Stolman Rainey has um, a really great piece in Madden, Madden America about different stories that some of us tell. And some of us wanna tell a story that makes people feel comfortable. Like I went through trauma, I got medication and therapy and then everything was fine and I lived happily ever after. Um, that's not how it works mm, for most folks. And it certainly was not how it worked for me. Um, but sometimes when you get a lot of attention for your story, you want to make people feel more comfortable, which is the whole challenge of, <laughs> of this work. So, um, I do want to say that, 
I still have tough days and I'll take one or three or all of these um, ways of showing up. Um, and, you know, there's no judgment of that. It's just, just how I am. So that's a little bit about my story. Um, I definitely talked for a while. I want to pause to see, um, Rose, were there any questions that came up so far? So I uh, don't see any questions on our Zoom video. Uh, we do have, just want to let everybody know that the Facebook live stream is finally working. Um, so if you have any colleagues that we're hoping to watch there, feel free to uh, let them know. I will include the link as well. I think you bring up such an interesting point, Kalechi, about what, what does a good survivor look like, right? And where do we get those um, expectations of what good survivorship sh should look like? And sometimes it's really challenging to counter the expectations of others while also trying to navigate your own recovery um, and do and make choices that work best for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think trying not to, you know, I think when people are interested in hearing our stories, sometimes we're just so excited, we want to share. And also there are other people who tell us to tell our stories in ways that will make people comfortable. And so I think that the part of the stories that are like, yeah, I still feel suicidal and I have to work on things. Um, and, you know, it isn't always great. Don't always make it into the conversation. And then that gives us an unrealistic expectation of what these experiences are like. So, you know, I definitely encourage you all to read more about that. Um, and I myself check myself to make sure that I'm not trying to be too recovery and shiny, but also want to share out hope that things do get better. And also that for me, you know, I got better. I don't know that life itself got better. <laughs> life continues to do whatever it's going to do, but how I deal with it is different. So... Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if there aren't any questions. Uh, so we actually, um, oh. not to get you off, Kalechi, but we do have a question that was just typed in um, from Daniel. He asks, how can advocates elevate trauma-informed processes and practices so that they can operate at scale in many different settings? So in schools and healthcare, et cetera. Oh, Daniel, that's such a great question. And I'm so glad to hear that you're on the call. Um, we will definitely talk a little bit more about that, but when we talk about trauma-informed care and we talk about approaches, we're really talking about not looking at why, you know, labeling someone or judging them, trying to see what happened to them and what's their story by not, and then also not trying to re-traumatize them by making them tell their story so many times. Um, we have a couple of places where we'll talk about what that might look like in a school setting, and I have some examples. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, we'll definitely be answering that question and feel free to ask more questions. Um, I'm gonna move into our next set um, of just insider information, and it's myth and facts about suicide. So there's a myth that suicide is a symptom of, symptom of untreated mental illness. And like I tried to say before, and even in my story, suicide cannot be attributed to a single cause. And sometimes we really try to focus on one thing. If we fix that one thing, we can um, fix the person. But a lot of people have different circumstances, whether that be social economics, different kind of traumas, um, things just aren't working the way that they want. And it's, you know, it's an option. It's just like there's many other options that we should be offering folks, but trying to always tie them in, um, we can get a little, uh, we're not trying to pathologize anyone. I think one of the biggest myths is that talking about suicide plants the idea. So talking about suicide does not cause suicide. We have to interrupt that. A lot of people don't want to talk about it because they think it will like spread. It's not a cold. Um, talking about it won't plant it into someone's like, someone's head. Um, it's really trying to normalize the conversation around suicide of like, oh, are you are you feeling this way? What's going on with you? Um, as opposed to shutting it down. I think when things are in isolation, they grow a lot more, and connectivity is what can interrupt some of this. I've definitely heard that suicide is attention seeking or manipulative. Um, I also was told that I was being dramatic or I should pray. Um, and sometimes people say suicide is a cause, you know, is a cry for help. And I'm like, if it's a cry for help and you should help the person, um, usually it's an act born of unbearable pain. 
Um, thinking about death and if death is the best option for someone, that means they're going through something really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, I think trying to be judgmental or trying to throw away something can be really difficult. And not everyone can deal with folks um, when they're in a really tough time. And so knowing what your own boundaries are, are important too. Suicide is an impulsive act with no warning. So I'll say that like most people do provide clues. Um, we do have people who present well or who mask a lot of things, but there can be some cracks or some, some indications or people just saying like, yeah, um, I'm really struggling right now or yeah, I don't wanna be here anymore. Um, there are some, some signs, there are some clues. So um, it's not, not random. It might seem random to someone who's not picking up on the signs, but um, there usually are some clues. Suicide people cannot help themselves. Um, that's kind of more into the helpless, um, you know, it's just part of the mental illness. One of the things we wanna get away from, like you're broken. Um, and you know, that's, that's not true. With, with the right supports, people can self-direct their recovery. Um, they can get better. Um, they can have healing and getting better looks different for each person. So my version of healing and recovery is not the same for someone else's. Um, and for me, when I hear a suicidal thought now, um, I use that as indication that something in my life needs to change. For me, it's not like Kalechi needs to go, but it's more of like, well, all right, something needs to change. That's your good red flag to self-direct or do something different. For other people, it looks different. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I work with a group of of folks who are suicidologists and I always ask them, you know, what are, what are some things you, that you would want um, other people to know? Like what do suicide attempt survivors want you to know? Um, and the first thing is we need to be heard and believed and the system prevention sh working with us should listen to suicide attempt survivors um, and learning in the field of suicidology. It sounds simple to be heard and believed, but a lot of times um, there's this perspective that if someone has attempted or has a mental health issue, they don't have insight into their own experience so that they, they're not clear, they don't understand their own story. That's what happened to me when I tried to seek help because I articulated too well, I couldn't, I couldn't need help. So we're saying that needs to definitely be interrupted and we should be involved um, and leading more of the work. Um, I think there's some shifts to that, but a lot more work can be done, especially around prevention. We need alternatives to 911 and hospitalizations. This is not the popular one because that's the first place people usually send people is either they'll call 911 or have them um, involuntarily committed. Um, there's a lot to say about this, but for communities of color, especially having law enforcement involved during a crisis can escalate situations and lead and sometimes lead to death. Um, so because of racism, racism, because of um, a lot of many other longstanding issues between communities of color and law enforcement, um, the first person you don't want showing up to your house when you are in a crisis is someone with a gun. Like that's just, you know, let's call it what it is. Uh, you need someone to not escalate, but to de-escalate the situation. That should be people who have lived experience, that could be crisis supporters, um, a whole host of things. Um, other community members have support as well and, and do provide that. So that's definitely one. Having peer respite centers and innovative solutions that don't re-traumatize consumers is really important. So a peer respite center is a place where, and a lot of these things do require funding, but there are places in California that have peer respite centers where someone who has lived experience of so someone like me might be working with someone who, else, who is in a crisis um, and they can come to have groups, have one-on-one -on -one peer support. It's about mutuality. There's not hierarchy or judgment, um, but have a kind of place to rest, like respite, um, not being locked up or ha having restraints. Um, and for those of you data, those you love data, um, I have two things that are really important in this conversation. So one is from Cambridge University uh, from 2016 is that prior psychiatric treatment was the single strongest predictor of suicide death. That is terrifying. 
the one place that everyone goes is a strong predictor of suicide death. That means we have to do something different. Um, it's simply stated. The second from psychiatric services, and I'm just, I'm calling out the highlighted, highlighted line is that psychiatric hospitalization is associated with an increased risk of suicide, even in those who are not admitted for suicidal thinking or behavior. Again, so that hospitalization, what happens in those places, the trauma that folks experience, makes someone more at risk of suicide, even if they didn't even go into the hospital for that. So if you think of our interventions as being law enforcement, and which then leads to um, hospitalization, and this is what our outcomes are, and this is what we're learning, this means we need something totally different. Like we need alternatives. Some people will say, that being hospitalized worked for them, and that, you know, that's fair statement, but for many of us who this is true for, it doesn't work. I'm gonna pause just to see if there's any questions that came up while I was talking. Also drink a sip of water. Anything come up yet so far, Rose? Let me unmute myself. No <laughs> questions so far, but I think you bring a, real, a really valid point about um, resources that work for certain communities and acknowledging that there are increased risks in supporting communities of color and yeah. in terms of um, unique risk factors based on, on um, our climate and um, different community needs. No, absolutely. And all communities of color are different, just like all communities. So what works in one community, even talking about mental health or or being hospitalized or having that conversation come up can really isolate them from other folks who might not have that same belief system. So when we think about recovery and feeling you know, more in touch with wellness for these diverse communities, maybe mental illness and um, those that kind of like biomedical model, technical, clinical language is foreign and scary, but most folks would want to sleep better or feel more connected or have better relationships. And so learning from the communities what makes sense for them is really important as opposed to just trying to put a framework on folks who, you know, who that won't work for. Um, it doesn't work. Um, thank you for that. Well, let's just keep going about what suicide attempt survivors want you to know. Um, so this is some insight from Sam Dylan Finch. She had kind of like a whole Twitter feed. Um, and so I get asked this a lot, but he said it super succinctly. So if you know that a loved one has a history of mental illness that could result in crisis, um, talk to them ahead of time of what they would like you to do in the situation. Ask them who you should call, where they would prefer to go and what their boundaries are. Like, can I take you to a crisis center? Do you have a therapist I can call? Is there a friend or family member I can take you to? Um, if there are lethal means nearby, remove them from the situation by either securing weapons or asking them if there's a safer place you can take them. So some of the, some of the folks uh, on this webinar will have heard of RAP, Wellness Recovery Action Planning, where you do this typically when you're in a good space, but you essentially create your own plan for if things start falling apart and um, you're, you're getting, heading into a crisis, whatever crisis means, whatever that word means to you, you have a plan, you know who can be involved, you talk to them about what you want, um, and you can also share it with your um, your providers and your mental health uh, professionals as you want. And so there's you making the decision. It's all about choices and options for that person. I'm gonna go ahead and continue. So this is getting back to um, what Daniel asked before about like what, what are some trauma-informed practices and some key characteristics. Um, so here are some things that we can do in practice, and this is from SAMHSA. Um, and this is understanding the prevalence of trauma and its impact and recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma and toxic stress. So educating yourself, understanding what is trauma, what that might look like, um, creating an emotionally and physically safe space. You know, sometimes you'll go, you know, students, young people, all folks, when we go to get help or services, um, if that place, um, I've been to places where there was like a bullet plate glass um, there's someone like really far away. It looks kind of scary. There's no pictures. There's no, like, there's nothing light or welcoming. Um, that can be like very scary to someone who is already having experience making places physically safe, um, and feel emotionally safe, um, empowering an individual with an active voice in collaborative decision-making. 
So again, for anyone who's having a mental health crisis or experience or any challenges, making sure they have decision making, making sure that they have a voice in their in anything, um, respecting a person's experience through active listening, being really careful what kind of language you're using, um, and really being transparent and trustworthy and being stable and consistent. If you say, I'm gonna, you know what, you're having a tough time, I'm gonna show up for you, I'm gonna be here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and you're not able to do Friday because you overextended yourself, that really does impact relationships. This all sounds pretty simple, but really involving and empowering people to have decision-making is so powerful and really is an intra trauma-informed practices and approaches. We can also send out um, some resources as well. Um, one specific example, um, for those of you who have heard of the Netflix series called 13 Reasons Why, um, where someone, um, it's told from the vantage point of someone who died by suicide and talking about all of the reasons why, um, kind of pointing out and blaming people for their experiences. Um, and that's been on Netflix. It's been something people have been really concerned about. It's aimed at teenagers. It is teenagers who are talking. Um, this amazing school, Oxford High School in Michigan, created this campaign called 13 Reasons Why Not and had students um, create tapes um, where they talk to people about, hey, you're, you're one of the reasons why I chose to stay here. Um, this is what you did that helped me. This is how you supported me. And so, you know, it's, it didn't take a lot of money or a lot of resources, but it incorporated storytelling, mental health awarenesses. They also had connections to resources and it was really aimed to change school culture and reduce shame and stigma about trauma and suicide. Um, and that's a really powerful thing that comes from communities in terms of like what healing could look like. Um, and this participant said, after my tape played, a sense of relief washed over me. Now people come to me for help. It's the most rewarding thing. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever done, but now I, I would do it 1000 times again. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of powerful things and movement and looking at ACEs study and trauma and what kind of approaches we can do at the system level. What kind of policies do you have at your school? Um, are you doing restorative justice practices or are you punishing someone? You know, there's a lot of intersectionality between trauma and suicide and toxic stress. Um, and so what are the things that you're doing to support community stakeholders and, um, and folks? All right. That was a lot. I'm going to pause again um, to see if there were any questions that came up. Um, and if not, we will move on to the last bit of learning from our contributors. So we have a question from Marsha. Um, so she mentions that we know time is limited for these webinars, unfortunately. Um, I wish they could be so much longer. Um, and still, I hope Kalechi will talk more about the picture, including what each of us who have privilege by skin color, economics, et cetera, can help make uh, cultural change so that every person feels valued and knows that they belong. I believe love really is the answer, meaning if that is how every person, living being, the earth is treated, every person's life more e might more easily become a life that they are glad to live, even though hard stuff will happen sometimes. No, thank you, Marsha. That's really powerful. And yes, big picture, looking at our system, looking at who is taking care of people. Um, you know, we need more, we need more diverse mental health providers and people with lived experience and peers, but we also need training for those folks who are not in the diverse communities um, to sit with folks, to hear what is working and what's not working. I think a lot of times different community members will show up, um, especially the black community members I've seen in many, many situations, they're having a mental health issue and they might appear aggressive or angry or that's how they're labeled. And then they get routed into the justice system. And that is the privilege of whoever is receiving them. What, what is this? Is this trauma or should I put you away? If someone is having a mental health experience or issue, they should not be getting treated in jail. And that's where a lot of communities of color are getting their first mental health treatment is jail mental health. Um, and I think that 
whoever the gatekeepers, which is usually, you know, um, folks who have the privilege to get that education, folks who have the privilege to get those roles or to get hired in those spaces, we need to bring up leaders who are reflective of the communities that you're serving. Um, and it's not enough to hire more people of color into a system because if they don't have any voice, a lot of times assimilation will happen um, just to make sure they keep their job. They don't want to be that one voice always yelling over people. Um, if they are, sometimes they're let go, especially feeling tokenized. So it's thinking about systems where there are partnerships with maybe community-based organizations. Leadership is shared and decisions are made together um, as opposed to having one person be responsible for, oh yeah, you're you're part of that community. Um, why don't you tell us on behalf of that community? I can't speak on behalf of the black community. Like I was an awkward black goth girl. Like I'm definitely a, a certain selection of some and I represent some, but I'm saying like our voices need to be at the table in decision-making places so that the system will change because integrating at different levels have to be all throughout um, and recognizing, recognizing and listening to that. Um, and doing your own work. A lot of people have to do their own work to hear people. I don't know what that looks like for each person, but that can really save, save lives. What's yours, what's mine? If that's mine, I should not be bringing it into healing spaces. I should be doing my own stuff um, so that I'm not interrupting someone else's process. So hopefully that's helpful. But yes, I wish we had more time to unpack all of this. So in the time that I do have left, um, I wanna talk about, um, lessons learned from our contributors um, and you'll be able to look at these uh, PowerPoints because I think they'll live on the internet forever I hope but this is LD Green my co-editor a great and amazing human this is our book we've been to patient voices from radical mental health um, there are stories and there's research both in here um, just a quick like I'm not going to go through all the contributors but you can see them there um, but we we have the introduction to radical mental health we have challenging the biomedical model neurodiversity narrative as a radical healing strategy we talk about trauma-informed care intersectionality of mental health and communities of color and suicide um, a point to that is that uh, since someone already asked marcia asked that really great question about the bigger picture data is a really big thing a lot of the data will say one thing and it's quantitative data and it's numbers, but the stories and the qualitative data does not always get collected. And so I just want you to all assume suicide impacts everybody, not just one group. And if you assume that, then think about how we should help each of these communities and how they would direct us. So getting better data to understand what, um, what we need to know um, is a really big thing. And there's like not a lot of gatekeepers of color um, to help those conversations. So if you are someone with privilege and you have a big heart and you care, talk about participatory action research and how you can integrate communities into your research to learn more. That would be tremendously helpful. Um, sorry, sidebar. <laughs> community art, spirituality, self-care, mental health, and then talking about the mental health ind industrial complex. We also have someone, and we have so many stories in our book um, that are really powerful, that are really just beautiful. We have someone who is a patient provider, so they are a patient, and they also work on a psych ward, and they talk about having, that, having a technical diagnosis and then also working with people um, and trying to be as trauma in, most trauma-informed as possible. We also have someone who, when they were a child, were medically abused by their psychiatrist who tried up to, I think, 14 different medications on them um, as a young person and that is abuse and they were you know getting funding from different pharmaceutical companies to test to test things out and that was not consent so when we talk about trauma um we're also talking about people have these really traumatic challenges and issues with the system and this wasn't years ago this is not that long ago you know i'm 34 and i have this trauma um, there's other young people who are still experiencing this so these are the things we're hoping to interrupt I will go into what is, why should we challenge the biomedical model? Um, this is a lot of text, but essentially the biomedical model is really focused on illness and brain chemistry. Like if we just, if we get that balance right, we'll be fine. And we'll, you know, and we will fix this with medication. So the treatment of illness is 
emphasized over the promotion of health because it's the belief that health is the absence of disease. Um, so this doesn't take into account race, culture, environment, spirituality, or identity. And if you're treating an illness, you're not working with a person and you're not integrating that person in their care. Um, I have this really short um, story that I heard um, from Eduardo Vega, one of the um, former directors of the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. He said there was a group of scientists that were work, scientists and clinicians working with a nomadic tribe in Africa. And when they went to visit this tribe, one of the individuals who was there um, was hearing voices and seeing things. And everyone in their community said, oh, this person has spiritual gifts. Um, they're deeply connected um, and we just accept them for who they are. And the clinician said, oh, this person has schizophrenia. He's very, very sick. You need to give him medication. Fast forward six, six to eight months, the scientists come back, the tribe has traveled and they come back to see where the tribe is. And they notice that person isn't there anymore. And they said, um, well, what happened? Where did he go? And they said, well, you told us he was sick. And in our culture, um, because we're nomadic, we have to leave the sick behind. That, that, that is, I, I don't have words for that. That is, that's exactly what's wrong with the biomedical model. You had someone who was totally accepted in their community and their culture um, as having just spiritual gifts. And then we put a westernized, um, medical framework over something and they're left to die like this is what i'm talking about this is why we need to get out of this framework because it's not helpful um and it's very harmful and and many people have lost their lives in many different ways so not saying this for our health but like that will forever haunt me and that's why that's why i do this work Another reason why we should challenge the medical model. Um, so from our contributors, the Mindful Occupation Collective, radical mental health is about challenging the dominance of biopsychiatry because it rests on the belief that mental health issues are, again, like I said, a result of chemical imbalances in the brain. And it's really saying that the individual is the blame and that we are the problem. It doesn't take in, you know, social and political issues or trauma or feelings. It doesn't take in the whole human experience. So, you know, this is probably familiar for many folks um, and you already know this, but that is problematic. So let's talk about radical mental health for a little bit. Um, and I will say that radical mental health might not sound super radical, but it really empowers us, like the person who is in the system, to come up with our own understandings about our psyches, our souls, our hearts, our experience, rather than do medical framework. So how I look at my trauma, how I process it, maybe I use medication and that's part of my own radical mental health, but I made that choice. Um, maybe I don't. Maybe I do yoga. Maybe I don't. Um, but my radical mental health is about options and it's supporting that person's self-determination, not coercing them into something you think they should do, but they have ongoing decision-making. So they are always driving, not some other professional who knows more about them than themselves. Like we know what we need. So the person is driving. And I think that's one of the big keys. Shifting into dangerous gifts. So dangerous gifts, um, very like very different from um, the biomedical model and even you know in some places recovery depending on how you um, view this but the Icarus project and we're lucky to have so many people from the Icarus project that were part of the book um, but it understands people's capac capacities for altered states as dangerous gifts to be cultivated and taken care of rather than a disease or disorder to be cured or eliminated so they really believe in intertwining madness and creativity and hoping that transformation will really like undo some damage so it's instead of saying like oh i have this disease it's like oh i have this gift and it might cause me to be up for many many hours but that's really powerful and i have to cultivate it um but it's embracing it and being proud of it like it's pr about pride not being like shamed or hiding it so it's a very different um way of approaching mental health so let me pause because I think I saw some questions um, and then we can get into the last couple of slides. Rose, did we have anything else come up? Yeah. So no other questions. A thought that came to mind was when you were speaking about 
involving the community with research, um, uh, particularly with United Survivors, you know, we really value those with lived experience because nothing should be about us without us. That's, yeah. that's our, um, you know, our motto and, and that it's so important to have those with lived experience have a seat at the table. And those of uh, us with privilege, both privileged and oppressed identities, figuring out ways to help others have their, their voice heard um, is, I think, a call to action, but also inspiring for what we will see in the future when it comes to um, suicide prevention efforts. Absolutely. And the nothing about us without us is com comes from the disability rights movement and the recovery movement. And so many of us like really embrace that. And I have seen a lot of people who work in the system do really good, good work. Um, they'll um, slowly integrate peer support. Oh, it just needs to be part of this program or I'm writing a grant and we'll just have peers in it. You know, there's a lot of ways to do good work from inside something that might not work so well um, until we're creating another system. So I do want to say for all of the mental health professionals and therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists who understand that lived experience is really important um, and are doing their best to integrate it uh, and working that. I see you. That's really important work. I just think we always need to think about doing more as well. Um, so we have this quote from Maya Angelou. I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Um, just, just keeping that with us um, in all of the work that we do um, and all of the lives that we touch um, and just get into the key takeaways. So if you didn't know, people should be involved in their own mental health care at every stage. They should be driving it. So hopefully I said that 30 or 40 more times. Um, people who are suicidal do get better, live really great lives, um, you know, and that is self-determination. Being a safe and trusted community member can help build resiliency and save lives. Peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is underutilized approach, so that's having people with lived experience give mutual aid, and it's really helpful. Um, what's not helpful is giving advice or platitudes, um, but listening goes a very long way. And provide opportunities for people to be active participants rather than recipients of like suicide prevention programs or any kind of mental health treatment. People should be involved. Um, the person who's the most marginalized and isolated and not part of your system that you're trying to reach should be involved in designing it because they'll know what they need. So I, I think we have pretty much tried to cover a lot of things in an hour. <laughs> but um, I did wanna say that if you would like to connect with me, um, if you'd like to continue the conversation, I'm always open. I'm really excited that the United Survivors have invited me to have this conversation and I implore you to do more research and work. Um, and again, I, I think you know people get better. Life is gonna do what it is, but I think people get better. So I think we have maybe a minute to answer any last thoughts or questions. And if not, then we can close out. Oh, that was so wonderful, Kalechi. Thank you so much. I, uh, you have virtual applause that's ringing, ringing through <laughs> the inner space. Um, so I've included links where you can contact Kalechi, her email, as well as a link to her book, uh, which is We've Been to Patient Voices for Ma Radical Mental Health, which she uh, was an editor with um, LD Green and um, United Survivors, one of the programs that we provide is our online course around telling your story and really being an advocate for the voice that you hope to share with others. So feel free to check us out at unitesurvivors.org. And as I mentioned, the webinar will be up and uh, accessible on our website, as will the PowerPoint slides. So Kalachi, those will live in per perpetuity. And I just, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to share your story, but also some absolutely encouraging suggestions and perspectives for the future and really holding um, the voices and the experience of lived survivor, or I'm sorry, those with lived experience uh, as we do our work. So thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. And thanks for everyone who joined. Really appreciate you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. 
and we will have a webinar around the same time in October. So feel free to tune in, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram for more information as that comes up.